as a collaborative and not consultant thing that's trying not to turn into a consultancy. Uh, Cost is the same thing. Uh, it, it's a couple years old now. It's been a community documentation specification effort for some time. I'm going to try to explain what we do, what we're trying to do, how we can help. Um, and yeah, uh, I tried to, the slides don't skew too political, but uh, because of uh, the topic, I, I can go into more detail. Um, ooh! Okay, that could look a little better. I'll, uh, I'll email out the slides or something that can be attached to the recording, if it helps. Uh, so, um, basic mental model I use when I'm uh, talking about CASA specs or, or talking about the scope of CASA. I try to think in the most general terms about crypto systems, not just blockchains. Lots of them are DAGs, DHTs, other decentralized architectures for data, transactions, information, identities. Uh, one generalized term, uh, I didn't define it on the slide, is DPKI, Decentralized Public Key Infrastructure. Fancy way of saying actors are identified by cryptography usually almost always um, asymmetrical cryptography, private public keys. So um, wallet, I'm here to find kind of vaguely, I'm wearing a account abstraction shirt, so you know I mean it in a more uh, complicated way than just EOAs in the Ethereum world, but uh, if you think of wallet more on the uh, software stack, uh, think of it as a user agent, the, which is like the sort of technical term for browsers. There's a lot of, you know, someone who, uh, Kyle from Bright Ape is very active in Casa, always says uh, we should think of wallets as the browsers of a Web3 platform, which is sort of like an in joke among W3C people, uh, because browser people always talk about the web platform as the sum of standardized interfaces that make the uniform of a web possible. So if we want an open Web3, Wallets have to sort of uh, uh, level up a little bit in the standardization department and have common interfaces. That fundamentally is for me what, why I got involved in CASA, what I think the short term goal of CASA is, is to, is to level up the standardization of a Web3 platform. And platform in the software <laughs> sense has a pretty different valence than platform in the economic <laughs> political economy sense, and we can maybe come back to that in Q&A or something, but yeah, uh, Wallet is the actual agent of the user, uh, which in many cases they trust more than their browser. Lots of people have five browsers, two or three wallets, they trust the browser with their money and password, a little less. Uh, so thinking about that, um, gaps, I think we can all agree what those are, those are things that help you form interactions with a blockchain or other data substrate. Nodes, I try to use the most general term. Uh, like clients kind of complicate things. The Ethereum doesn't really have like clients, but lots of cryptographic systems have tiny like clients that can run in a browser extension. You can run IPFS locally, so like the node, you have to think a little more abstract uh, to get the whole category there. Contracts, uh, I have my favorite Vitalik tweet here, uh, regretting the term smart contract. Uh, but I, we still call them contracts in CASA, CASA so we keep, keep them around for legacy terms, but try to include anything that is uh, a decentralized automaton, a piece of script uh, that's like a cockroach that will survive the death of its uh, creators and companies. Uh, and yeah, state, uh, ledger, chain. So, um, this over here is like the classic EIP layering that you have laid out in EIP1 and sort of canonical to Ethereum. Um, this diagram is like a little more, uh, it's like a UML diagram. So each of those circles is a interface, a variously standardized interface. Um, not even 
this layer is 100% standardized, as the Ethereum uh, execution API team will tell you. There's still little discrepancies between the data models of the different ETH clients, very slightly, like having to do with type systems of languages. Uh, and the top two total chaos, and I think the top two are way less standardized than the bottom two for a lot of reasons, including political and ideological ones. Like a lot of people just think of the, d the DAP layer and the wallet layer as something that just needs 10 more years to even form. There's this like uh, faith in the efficiency of competition and innovation. Uh, I think sort of baked into blockchain culture so far. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't specify and pre-standardize and collaborate and coordinate across competitive relationships to build ecosystems. Like the difference between an ecosystem and a market or a platform is just how much you're willing to collaborate with competitors. Uh, and that's that's a big thing with CASA. Uh, part of what makes all standardization political is that you kind of need to collaborate across relationships of competition and zero-sum games to standardize anything. Uh, there's still plenty of soft power and there's still plenty of collusion and coercion, but uh, it, you create a public option when you standardize things. It's sort of like, uh, you know, in Josh's book, there's this uh, com communism talk that science is communism. Uh, you, you create a public option if you document things in the open, you open source as you go, you design in the open, uh, that really sort of speeds up the needless competition phase of capitalist innovation, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, okay, so that's a learning model. Those are the definitions again, if seeing them again helps this be less so opaque. Um, So, yeah, I actually spent uh, Monday through Thursday of blockchain week in Seville talking to browser people uh, at, at the W3C annual conference uh, and fighting about ITF stuff there. So, um, I, I think that when we compare this set of software that is running all of this uh, funny money to conventional software, web two software, web open web software, web one software, um, you that you sort of uh, feel the uh, different relationship to competition that's in the DNA of it and in the culture of it so far, and I do think that a lot of these interfaces that are slow to standardize or are standardized like opaquely or by brute market force, uh, those sorts of patterns are happening because of the relative maturity of the infrastructure. And I mean that not in the sense of like infrastructural software, but infrastructure in the sense of like server clusters and legal arrangements and configurations of capital and like clarity on which clouds are going to let us run what. and how soon AWS will reverse engineer all of it. Um, so in that sense, like the it, it, it's hard for software to be more standardized than the economics behind it is. Uh, so comparing Web3 software and standards to Web2 software and standards, I think the the not to not to be all uh, base superstructure about it, but different configuration of capital just uh, pretty obvious effects on who wants to collaborate with competitors and who wants to build uh, public options and uh, neutral bridges. But uh, yeah, um, the this is just a list of complications in general of standardizing interfaces uh, and uh, you know hardening the stack, as they say. Uh, networking compute arms races sort of touched on that, but you know, like the the fact that all of this is running on video video CPUs, uh, GPUs. I mean, has a lot to do with uh, those sort of competition with the conventional software industry. <laughs> um, 
What else can I say? Governance pollution. Oh, uh, in honor of uh, uh, the topic of the event today, I, I do think that um, my lightning, lightning argument within a lightning talk about venture funding would be that uh, we talk so much about decentralizing and like the layer on which we are the least decentralized is the funding. Like the funding creates incentives that turn each blockchain and blockchain system into a centralization point and a single point of failure in many cases. And the collusion is, you know, uh, pretty, pretty on chain, pretty obvious, pretty e easily documented. But uh, so yeah, I do, I do think that it takes a, a pretty deliberate and conscious and usually ideological coordinated effort to say like, let's all take pay cuts and not work for vendor, venture backed projects if we want this to go faster in the public goods direction. Uh, so that's uh, that. Oh, and the one thing I will also say, uh, hand in hand with uh, huge amounts of venture capital and its usual conditions on progress, uh, there's also this thing that happens in Web3 and in most dominantly venture funded corners of the software world where once you have a project, once you have sort of recurring revenues and a sustainability, then you open source your design protocols, convince everyone else to use your thing. Sort of like standard after the fact, like standard once you've captured the market. Um, my experience coming from W3C, IETF, uh, five years of working on uh, identity primitives uh, and open, open ecosystems is that uh, people who've already dominated the market don't necessarily garner buy-in from their challengers to standardize something. It doesn't really work that way very well in most cases. So I, I, I often encourage people to think critically about when to standardize things and if the word is really standardized, uh, if a market already has a winner. Um, but okay, so chain agnostic uh, gets gets thrown around a little. I want to clarify a little the scope of Casa because it's a standards alliance and standards folks like a clearly defined scope. Uh, we're OCD nerds. Um, no, uh, no. Maxi talk is allowed on CASA calls and the public events. We try to discourage arguing about which chain is better uh, than which chain. Like all chains are a set of trade offs, optimizing for different variables. There's strengths and weaknesses to any architecture and any piece of software. So, uh, yeah, Ma Maxi talk's not allowed, even if, you know, this is an Ethereum, <laughs> this is an Ethereum meetup. Uh, some of my best friends are Maxis, but. You know, uh, your, your personal preferences or your ideological and political preferences for which set of trade-offs you prefer software to make should not uh, limit the conversation uh, and objectivity thereof. So yeah, we, that's one of the only rules of cost of events is please don't show your products, please don't show your favorite L1. Um, we try to keep things flexible and uh, dis we discourage sort of specs written at CASA from uh, skewing towards a choice of network or a choice of system. Uh, that's kind of impossible to do in practice. It's sort of aspirational more than, it, it, it's neither um, falsifiable or testable uh, nor enforceable, but we aspire to not in write EV EVM preference into the things we write, for example. Um, and yeah, we're, we're trying to abstract out Web3 development from specific blockchain system development. Like most people, Web3 is super complicated, super esoteric, super new. No one learned about it in school except very recent arrivers. Um, so most people sort of learn one blockchain system first. Maybe if they're lucky, learn a second and a third. But they're, we're very, very early for having 
a chain agnostic understanding of how these systems work. They're so emergent. There's like, what's cool about blockchains is uh, we're still finding the words for. So one of the goals of the chain agnostic standards alliance is to sort of differentiate what's cool about Ethereum from what's cool about blockchain in general, like finding a Web3 style of engineering and, and architecture. Um, so yeah, we, we write specs and specifications to help all developers, public option, design in public. Uh, that includes non-technical stuff. We have a, a working group on UX, the chair of which is here somewhere. There is a chair, Ryan from Fission. Uh, you can find him if you want to talk about UX. Uh, we're actually doing, CASA's organizing a uh, wallet unconference in Istanbul which is in coordination with the UX event that Ryan's also working on. Um, what else can I say? Um, so yeah, we write these chain agnostic improvement proposals, which are like EIPs, but do not assume Ethereum or Bitcoin or anything else. Like they're, they're improvement proposals for this abstract concept of Web3 engineering, whatever that will look like someday in retrospect. Um, and anything EVM specific or, or system specific sort of gets profiled down. So like each gate we write, there's each sort of blockchain system has to constrain that to be valid in their system. So it's like, a, you know, we have like a generic concept of an address and then a Bitcoin address is a subset of that and an Ethereum address is a subset of that. Um, so if you're familiar with that kind of technical writing, like their, their profiles. Um, yeah, and we do work outside of UX and outside of crypto systems, like authorization and data plumbing. Um, we even had a proposal recently for a CAPE about, uh, this is really interesting, the way nodes, when they're trustlessly handshaking and discovering other nodes, finding out which version of the software they run, Someone was like, this is a shared problem I see across all L1s. Uh, and so we may have a cape about that soon, which is to say we hope to someday have capes at all four layers, not just the top two, but the top two are sort of like the easiest place to start because that's really urgent. People are trying to build cross-chain, chain agnostic dApps and wallets. So that's sort of an urgent need to figure out how we can efficiently develop those without having to start over every 18 months. Um, okay, so um, yeah, and one little note, I, I often find myself um, asked like, is IBC chain agnostic? Or is XCN, like the polka dot cross chain thing, chain agnostic? And uh, so in in CASA, we talk about namespaces, which are sort of like broadly defined systems, like all of EVM is the EIP-155 namespace. Bitcoin in all its forks is the BTC namespace, the CASA. And like uh, Polkadot XCM is a, is a uh, runtime agnostic way that customized runtimes can communicate um, between them but they're all block, they're all polka dot uh, runtimes, and they're all polka dot addresses and polka dot RPC calls. Sort of like they have most of the stuff in common. So like XCN is a cross chain protocol within a system of many chains and multiple coordination chains in their case. And similarly, like IBC standardizes on the networking layer within Cosmos and Cosmos compatible chains. So it's like um, half of what uh, CASA tries to make it possible to abstract across, they don't have to worry about, it's already equal. Um, it's already like interoperable. So like, I like to say that the, the use cases we want to work on in CASA are way harder. Like we want an Ethereum chain to be able to spin up a Bitcoin private key and become a Bitcoin wallet as well in the same wallet. I, we want dApps to be able to accept radically different kinds of coins, tokens, signatures, 
wallets. Like we, we want to dream bigger than everyone just use XCM or everyone just use IBC. Like we're, we're trying to document the basics so that people can build these cross system systems. Um, and yeah, benefit from the scale, uh, the economies of scale created by standardized interfaces. Um, okay, so I'm not sure I actually delivered a lightning talk. I think I just talked really fast. Uh, so Q and A is totally valid uh, for the questions to be like, could you just rewind and explain the slide better? Um, good. And any anywhere you want to go. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. How does one get involved with the oh, chain agnostic? Okay. Dang it, I have a slide for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, but it, it's just GitHub. Like, you just buy it, GitHub slash chain agnostic. So you, you can um, look at what we've already written. Um, the, I'm going to post these links. Actually, all these slides are already on our namespace in the gatherings repo, but, um, you know, we, we publish capes and namespace documents that help you sort of like add a totally different kind of crypto to your dApp or wallet. Um, and all of it is just on GitHub. And like if you find a typo, you just open a PR and then you're a contributor. There's there's lightweight IP for everything. But only a few working groups have make you sign a sort of patent release before contributing substantially. Um, for the most part, this is just in the open public good. Awesome. Um, what a What's the process like for getting a, a proposal approved, right? Because many EMPs are just like sitting there for fucking ever. Um, is there a difference with this is being recorded? I will not say anything about the EMP process. Um, no, the 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 process is actually pretty. Um, uh, we we try to make it more horizontal. So like. I am, Leaky and I edit everything. And uh, if we don't notice anything logically or typographically wrong, and multiple competitors from an ecosystem all say this is accurate, we're like, sounds good to me. Things go in as soon as people that know what they're talking about have agreed there's nothing <coughs> erroneous or misleading about PRs. So if you're documenting a namespace, you're documenting something I know nothing about, like EOS IO or something. Good example because we need that stat. Actually, someone needs that, and I can't write it. So anyone who knows EOS, um, find two other people that know EOS that don't obviously work for the same people, and review each other's PRs, and it goes in. Cool. Lastly, if I can ask one more, um, what kind of culture do you want to create in terms of like the? Uh, the the standards body or like the contributors to uh, you know the the proposals that want to get getting adopted like are you looking for certain things are you like uh, nerd swiping we just need maximum nerd swiping no I'm kidding uh, <laughs> no what 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 do you mean by looking for certain things yeah I guess um, how do you balance kind of like uh, you mentioned before um, the idea that if multiple competitors agree then this is a good candidate to, uh, you know, like implement. Um, yeah. So on the other side, like um, these competitors, right, or these like different actors, they have kind of like different levels of, let's say, like clout and so on, right? And then there's like uh, other considerations around kind of like the arguments, right? There's all kinds of considerations for why standards might get adopted or not. So like what do you place value on? And like, what do you kind of like intentionally, uh, you know, sort of signal to the people in the community to place values on? Okay. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for putting it. I didn't understand it at first. Um, so I think the tra transparency is the main thing. Uh, in terms of cloud, you know, a lot of times when people talk about standards politics, they mean politics in the sense of like soft power. They mean in the sense of like uh, unconscious subjective influence and, you know, cloud, cloud stacking. Um, we, like, if, I don't know, if 
super big name, like the tablet comes and opens PR, and then other people, I don't think that's accurate, that doesn't work in my use case, here's a corner case, I can point to links, like I can document the corner case. Um, I, I'd like to think I would be like, sorry Patel, like, like that don't fly here. I, I'd like to think that there's uh, not a cult of personality at all in Costa. I'd like to think there was the opposite already, but that's what we use Skype for. Like it's, like, it should be non-commercial and it should be non-relative, you know, as far as possible, because it's not cloud power. Uh, that, that wouldn't get us very far. Um, honestly, what a lot of times, like, we encourage people to take co-authorship credit on cakes if they point out, like, a breaking corner case or something. Like, a, any significant contribution should be on the same level. So like if a famous person opens something, they end up with like five co-authors. Like I think that helps champ down the, the hero worship thing, the influencer thing. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, less collusive than W3C and less nerd swipey than ITF, uh, which is saying very little. <laughs> Probably a little faster than the EIP, although the EIP process, um, is getting better and like I've been making a conscious effort to contribute more proactively to EFEs lately because it does feel like there's sort of a sea change happening. Like there was a PR on EFE one recently, or well, not EFE one, but on the informational EFE that has the process stuff in it. So I do think that EFEs are speeding up and getting a little more um, like overt and user friendly to PR, to openers of EFE PRs. Um, there's been talk of possibly a, because uh, like the EIP, oh sorry, so in this layering diagram, uh, the, the network of the core EIPs are like customizing their process a little bit to, to work uh, a little more hand in glove with the all core devs. And we've been talking about whether interfaces and possibly or interfaces and DRC could also work more hand in glove with the all wallet devs to sort of get the um, sort of tailored process that would keep it lower the number of EIPs and PRs just timing out or just going stale for lack of editor action. The hard part is that um, Casa, like I work pretty much half time at Casa, like I work 20 hours a week and there's very few PRs. The EIPs get 100 times more PRs and have like no one who is even 20 hours a week devoted to them. So like it's sort of just a garden variety labor problem. Like I would, I think maybe the best way for uh, our community as a whole to, to uh, elevate the status of the EIP editors would be like for companies to sponsor them or co-sponsor Like It would be great if people could say like, I want to take a year off from development. Will any four companies each sponsor me fractionally to just be an EIP editor full time for a year? Like, that's, I think that would help a lot um, across the different task forces. Like, I, I think the core EIP process has been volunteer for a while and like cost of doesn't need to be because we did the pass around the hat thing early. <laughs> um, yeah, and we have a this thing now If anyone wants to donate uh, to keep to keep the keep me half time uh, and to keep events uh, lovely. But um, yeah, does that answer your participation question? Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, <laughs> see you soon. I hope. Um, yeah, um, made a comment about uh, VC funding and got a few death stares. Um, Can we pause the recording? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to have a job someday. Um, <laughs> I, I worked in VC for some years and I actually really agree with you that it's good for spotting these patterns. Um, I was wondering if you had, in a constructive way, any, any thoughts, maybe like it seemed like there were some standards thinking around funding. There's patterns that you're spotting. Is there anything there that uh, is worth almost? I almost imagine one more layer. I like to solve that. Uh, but but it, it seems like you had some thoughts on that. I was wondering if. Uh, it was there. 
Uh, I mean, I think, I don't know how quickly it will happen, but we just have to evolve, I think, a vocabulary by the community. I mean, part of, it kind of all comes down to transparency because, um, like, uh, I don't know where you went, Wassum was here earlier, Wassum gave, like, two talks this week about basically educating yourself to be a critical reader of coin distributions. Like, tokenomics is uh, a somewhat accelerated high tech version of classic, uh, like, essay disclosures and stuff. And I do think, like, everyone in the space needs to self-educate on, like, what a good coin distribution is, or like what a fair distribution is, or what a plausible or even feasible exit to community looks like mathematically. Because like if we don't have authorities, like neutral authorities to <coughs> give thumbs up and thumbs down to each new token launch, pre-mine, whatever, we kind of just keep falling for the same shit over and over again. Because not, not, not enough of us are economists. Not enough of us worked in VC to like spot it. And not enough VCs have worked in VC long enough. <laughs> so there's some people in the 30 around. <laughs> yeah, um, in positions of huge capital authority, <laughs> capital allocation authority. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of VC that I love. A um, lot of smart, brilliant, fair people in VC. I really think it's just about supporting transparency or just like building up transparency as the norm that we call people out when they fall short of it. Because, I don't know, too much of this stuff is backroom dealy. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question in the future perspective. That uh, it is based on two factors. First factor is that uh, if we consider the Ethereum improvement proposal, for example, like the ERP 4844 for the data compression mm. foundation. On, yeah. And the second factor is like the, uh, the AI industry, like uh, we have out there large scale models to run on the community hardware. So, like, uh, that means they will have, like, what to say, uh, uh, they will be able to run like a huge program yeah. on the low performing computer. I don't know, like the question is oriented to the gas fees. Do you think in the future like the gas fees disappear like if we reach the level of how to say running any kind of program on on, on this how to say chip hardware? Mm. I mean Oof. Uh okay so if I, if I understand the question, it's like a Moore's Law question, like how many years before we stop have to worry about gas? I think that it's like gas is just translating um, capital on one layer to capital on another layer. So like, in a sense, there's already gas-free L2s because they're getting subsidized like Uber was for 10 years or Airbnb, right? Like. It's, it's all a matter of scale. So if there's enough uh, speculative funding and financialization in a subnetwork, that subnetwork won't really need gas. And probably over time, compute will come down faster than storage in the next 20, 30 years. But I do think like the fundamental problem is still uh, political, not technical. Like it, it, I don't think it'll ever come down enough that no one has to pay for gas. It's always just there'll just be a smaller amount that someone is paying to have an information advantage on someone else. Sorry, that was an extremely cynical take, but uh, I should end on a higher note than that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do think like um, the compute thing. Yeah, it's 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 going to come down a lot in five or ten years, and I think it'll really change the economics. But I don't think it'll change the politics too much. Would be my personal prediction, if, which I hope is what you were asking for. <laughs> okay. uh, Thank you very much. Give a big round of applause to Jerome.